Pat Morrow is a quiet and modest man. He pioneered winter ascents here in the Rockies and new waterfall ice climbs. Uh, he went on to achieve great fame when he became the first person in the world to climb all of the highest summits on the seven continents. Pat is also an accomplished photographer and filmmaker with many books and films to his credit. I caught up with Pat at his home here in Canmore on December 5th, 1996. Well, I grew up in uh, Kimberley, B.C., and uh, I was lucky enough to uh, uh, come upon a couple of older climbers in uh, the St. Mary Valley be in the Purcell Range behind Kimberley, and uh, I'd never seen a real climber before. And in those days, in the I guess it was the late 60s, uh, there were no climbers in any of the little towns in the interior of BC. Just most of them were in Calgary or Banff areas, Vancouver. And um, so it was really lucky that I came upon these, these old, you know, the one guy was 55 years old and I was like 15 or 16, something like that. And um, so it was a spectacle to me and I didn't realize that anyone could do it. You know, at the end of the day, after we, my friend and I had watched these guys climbing a 50 meter high uh, rock cliff, they threw a rope down to us and we tied on and scrambled up the rock pitch. And uh, that, that uh, was my exposure to the thrill of climbing. And that, I was hooked from that moment on. About a year and a half, two years later, I came to Calgary to study journalism at SAIT. It was a big uh, social scene with the Calgary Mountain Club as well as active climbing in the mountains. And I remember uh, <clears throat> going down to Okotoks Rock in the springtime for training for the for the for the mountains, and and then going to the bar afterwards. And you know, it was a perfect combination of uh, getting to know someone and uh, and basically making uh, training. A, fun kind of a thing. Again, it wasn't looked at it really as training, it was a warm-up. Not like training is looked at these days, where people are really serious, you know, and they <clears throat> they, they watch their diet, they, you know, and uh, they train seven days a week, basically. In those days, it was, if you're really lucky and the weather was good, it was Wednesday night, because that was bar night, pub night. <clears throat> and then uh, every weekend, pretty well, I was out with um, two or three of the fr of my friends, and they made it the, at the club. Yeah, what were some of your uh, early climbs there in the seventies that uh, you remember? Some of your better climbs? Oh, well, the, the 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 most exciting one for me was doing about the second or third ascent of Cascade Waterfall <clears throat> in about whenever it was seventy um, with Chris Perry and um, Peter Svengrowski when he was active and Diana Kanak. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, exciting because we had shit equipment. You know, we had old uh, alpine axes and uh, soft, uh, bendable crampons. And uh, we ended up cutting steps for half the half the distance. Mm -hmm. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was like a, you know getting off at, in the dark by headlamp, rappelling down. It was not unique by any means because many ice climbs end, end that way. But it was, considering now you can zoom up there and back in a couple hours from the highway. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It was an all day or, ordeal. You did, uh, somewhere in there, you did an early ascent of, uh, winter ascent of uh, Assiniboine too. You right. traversed the mountain. Yeah. That was a really good experience for me because um, I learned what you could uh, go through and survive. And, you know, I we, we basically bivouacked with no sleeping bags on the south side of the mountain in a with, uh, in a snow cave that we dug with our hands. And that um, that night it was about 25 below zero Fahrenheit. And uh, I only ha I I got some frost frost nipped toes, and the other guys didn't get 
any kind of damage to them. So it was it was quite an eye opener to see what you could go through, and and uh, not that I wanted to go through it again, but um, it uh, you know it it showed me um, the threshold of the human body. Yeah. Yeah, well, we went over the top that same day and down to find snow to dig into. Oh, I see. You've been wrecked on the descent. Yeah, there was no snow on the north side. We didn't use our crampons. It was a dry. It was, it was February, I think, and uh, the whole north side was almost dry. Oh, so you climbed the north side and descended? Yeah. Something. I've always been under the impression you came the other way. See, we didn't want to come back down this way because we knew we'd get stranded up high. So. We, when we were on top, we could look down and see that there was tons of snow on the south side. So we headed down that way. Yeah. I did a number of winter climbs, you know, like um, first uh, winter Santa Huber with Chris Perry, which involved uh, can't, uh, digging another snow cave, but this time in controlled situation on the way up the mountain. And uh, at, an attempt on the north face of Robson, which uh, took about nine days, and we were trapped in a snow cave for most of the time in, in storms. And um, a lot of uh, forays into the interior ranges, you know, climbing in the Bugaboos, the Valhallas, etc. And uh, going down to the States, doing a bit of climbing in uh, uh, Leavenworth. That was my favorite place in the early 70s. And just basically, you know. I couldn't, I couldn't really call it an apprenticeship because I, you know, I didn't have any real um, strong regimen of wanting to, you know, learn a lot about climbing. It was just, it was going hand in hand with my uh, desire to make a living in photography, and it, I was going to school for, you know, most of those years either at SAIT for journalism or at the photography course at Banff. That's right. So it was like, you know, climb whenever you can. And um, all the rest of the time spent in school, and then right after school, getting um, trying to you know find work as a freelancer. Yeah. One of the, one of my earliest breaks in photography was um, all the pic the ice climbing photos I'd taken uh, in the, the early '70s were uh, published by Summit Magazine. They ran a huge you know, cover story and a whole bunch of in, inside pictures, about 75, I think it was, they ran. And um, that really kicked off my enthusiasm for, you know, following a career in, in uh, adventure journalism, basically. And, uh, and I think that also put the American climbers' antennae up about the possibilities of uh, waterfall ice in the Rockies. Because until that time, it had been an activity that uh, generally, uh, Canadians and, and uh, expat climbers who were living in Canada were pursuing. And um, uh, once, you know, and I, I've, I've found um, that publishing information like that in a, in, a, in a magazine that reached other audiences outside of the country um, sparked a lot of interest. Yeah, and we started yeah. seeing more Americans coming up after that's, that. That's well, the Claude team was made up of uh, mostly Calgary climbers, and um, uh, most of them, I believe, were Brits, and except for Eckhart Grassman, Swiss. And uh, my partner was uh, Bernard Amon from Kimberley, where I, I lit, grew up and uh, was living again. The reason it was called Claude was because um, most other Calgary climbers were off on other expeditions that year, and so this it was called Calgary Leftovers on Denali. And uh, I don't know if it was uh, uh, Bugs or or John Jones that made up that that name, but one of those guys came up with it, and so we basically. Um, uh, decided to meet at Talkeetna, the, the jumping off point for the expedition. And um, Bernard and I chose to drive up in his, in his uh, Volkswagen Beetle, which took us days and days of driving. And we were on each other's nerves by the time we got even to the start of the climb. The other guys uh, flew in 
to uh, Anchorage and took a train up. And um, when we flew onto the mountain as a group, because the regulations at that time stipulated that you had to have a group of four or larger. And once we hit the mountain in typical Calgary Mountain Club style, we, we split off in groups of two to do different routes that we had our eyes on. And um, that's, that's going against the, uh, the law <laughs> on the mountain. Yeah. What, uh, what route did you climb? Uh, we uh, originally were going to look at the, either the Cassin Ridge or the West Rib. And uh, when, we, when we got to the, the East Fork of the Tal uh, Cahilton Glacier, where you could actually see all, the whole south, uh, south uh, west side of the mountain, we saw this other rib that um, was just to the left of the West Rib. And uh, we heard, we were talking with some Americans that were also looking at that route. And so we decided to uh, have a go, uh, Bernard and I decided to go for that one. Mm -hmm. And that, that in, involved, uh, I think, uh, two and a half solid days of climbing to get up. Um, and the American, the two American guys came up behind us, and they hesitated on their their uh, second day, and then which cost them a lot of time because then a storm hit, and they they didn't. It took them seven days basically to do the same thing we did in two and a half days. Yeah. Luckily, we were above the at the upper end of the rib when the storm was started to hit. Yeah. What did you call that rib? Uh, southwest rib. Yeah. 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 And, and that was a new route. Yeah, to, and that was a new route to the Windy Corner, which uh, intersected the West Buttress route. And then from there, we climbed the Orient Express, which was the direct uh, route up the West Face. And that, that expedition was so painful, you know, the experience of altitude, you know, going to altitude for the first time, that I, I decided never to... Um, go on another altitude climb again. <laughs> well, that changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what, uh, what changed your mind? Uh, one of the other guys on that expedition was Roger Marshall from Golden, and Roger soon after got permission to uh, climb Everest from the Nepalese Tourism Department. And he invited a couple of the guys that had been on the, that Claude expedition to join him. It, it really evolved into something different, you know, uh, in terms of the change of the leadership. Because Roger backed out of that and um, at a fairly early stage and passed on the, all the work and the responsibilities to uh, George Kinnear. It's it, it's started to be drummed up into a, a national expedition, which attracted uh, some sponsors again. These I don't know the exact stages and the dates and everything, but John Amat became one of the, the business manager, and with his flair for self promotion and you know his understanding of the business uh, community and sponsorship, it it turned into a, a really big deal. We had uh, some a couple of accidents within two days that created a rift in the team. You know the first was. Uh, major avalanche that killed three Sherpas and almost, uh, I mean the whole team was in the ice fall at the time, so it could have potentially uh, hit many more people. And the second was uh, uh, ice fall collapse, you know, on top of a climber, uh, Blair Griffiths. Yeah. And again, there, there were several people with him and he's the only one that got hit hard yeah. enough to I think that the nature of these tragedies was a separate entity in itself. You know, I don't think it it tipped the scales one way or another. I think it just convinced half the team not to go on. I mean, they, they just re reckoned that it was too dangerous to continue. Yeah. And, and they had to make this very difficult decision because they had spent as much time as anyone else in getting the, the momentum up to, to go there in the first place. Right. And so for them, you know, walking down valley, I know Tim uh, said, 
he, he walked for half a day and he was really regretting not not staying on but at the time it seemed like the right thing to do yeah and uh, Dwayne actually did walk down for a whole day and changed his mind and came back yeah. <clears throat> so uh, and even the even the decision to stay was a hard one you know like psychologically you've lost half the strength of your team and some of the most talented climbers walked out you know uh, well Jim and um, and uh, Tim and Rusty Bailey. I mean, I didn't realize how how much of a circus it was with 16 climbers and four or five base camp personnel, you know, uh, until we got above the ice fall, and then all of a sudden we were the same size as Ed Hillary's team in '53. You know, there were eight climbers and uh, 12 Sherpas, I believe, and uh, it was a quite a manageable size of team. And then all of a sudden, we felt like I, I felt more of a that we had a t more of a team then, you know, because people were working together like professionals. You know, it was quite quite a different flavor. Yeah, we we were lucky. We had uh, quite good weather. There was one period. I, I think it was a four-day windstorm that kept us in our tents at that high camp, the twenty-one thousand foot advanced base. <clears throat> but that's the only sustained bad weather we had, with the occasional you know, snowstorm here or there. Lori, when he came down on his, from his summit day, he told me that um, he wished I could have been up there to see that sunrise over Tibet, because he said it was beautiful, you know, just to take photos of it or something. And um, I, all I was aiming for was uh, the south call, so I could see that same s sunrise. I didn't think I could go get to the summit at all when I took off from the high camp to the south call. Because I hadn't planned a, on anything after Everest. You know, there was, like Everest was the focus for four years, and um, getting to the top really kind of left a, a hole in my my uh, soul, really. You know, I, uh, I was kind of grasping for direction after that. And that's when I was walking out of the mountain thinking about what I'd done up to then, you know, with the climbing in various places and uh, realizing I had climbed three of the seven summits of the seven continents. Well, I mean, I, I had lots of time to think about it on the walk out and also in the, in, the inter, in the months after the expedition because I was working in Montreal actually for a month and a half editing 18,000 slides from everyone's, all the pictures that were taken by everyone. And so I was basically there with time to think and time to talk to other people. And I talked with uh, James Lawrence, the editor and publisher of uh, Equinox magazine, who ran a really big story on that climb. And um, he encouraged me to go ahead and do the Seven Summits when I told him about the project. Yeah. And so with his support and with his encouragement. Um, it was a natural kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, my horizon was filled again with goals. And, uh, except that it took a lot longer than I thought it would. Yeah. The hardest climbs I'd already done, you know, Aconcagua, uh, McKinley, and, and Everest. And I thought for sure I could just zoom up the other ones in one year. And it took four years. Yeah. And um, the whole and and the the downside of the project for me was that in those four years I did less climbing than I had done in the previous ten years <laughs> because all it all the time all the spare time was consumed by logistics and finances fi figuring out ways of getting to the mountain and, and paying for the cost of getting there so. With um, with lots of help from my friends, I was able to finally figure out ways of, of doing this. But there were, it was really frustrating because there's so many setbacks, you know, in, along the various legs. Of the yeah, yeah. I know there were. Maybe you could tell us about uh, 
some of the other climbs that we, we skipped at Concagua there, yeah. which you climbed yeah. before Everest. Yeah, that was a training climb with um, Speedy Smith and Roger Marshall and uh, Dave Reed. And uh, that was actually a, a, a turning point in terms of learning how to cope with the effects of altitude on the body for me because I was there with, with those guys in, in my little cluster, in you know, my little team. But on the same route, which was the Polish Glacier route, there was a guided team, you know, of a couple of guys from uh, Mountain Travel in the States. And I got to know those guys over the course of the expedition and learn how to pace myself from the one that uh, Bruce Kleppinger, the leader. And that made all the difference in the world. Like, all of a sudden, the pain disappeared from climbing at altitude. Even to the point where, on summit day, like, I'll just explain quickly that the real simple solution to getting over the, the problems of hitting the wall at altitude. And that is just to walk slower than you think you can. You know, like your mind, at this altitude, when you climb up a slope, you basically go as fast as your legs and your lungs will allow you. At altitude, you just simply cut it in half. You know, and and uh, you're guaranteed of arriving at your high point with enough energy to do something, you know, to get back down safely or put up the tent or chop the platform for the tent. And it was really, um, you know, a really simple solution. And yet my partners didn't see that, and they, they didn't learn anything on that climb. I ended up going to the summit uh, basically by myself. Like, all, my partners just kind of strung out all along the ridge behind me. And I just sort of walked along the summit ridge, which is a walk, and uh, came down with uh, the other team. And then, and then as we were coming down, my partners were straggling up. They, they, they made it okay, but it took them a long time because they were just basically pushing themselves as hard as they could go and, and then being becoming exhausted. Right. But another, and then soon after that, I went to uh, Western China with uh, John Amat and Lloyd Gallagher and Steve Bezrushka. And um, that was uh, one of the most fun experiences I've ever had because what it did was it combined a trip into an exotic culture with a climb of a significantly high peak, you know, 7,500-meter uh, peak. And um, that put us up into a, an altitude where <clears throat> not, hardly any of the other climbers had been to that altitude before going on to Everest. The, the other guys had done more difficult climbs at lower altitudes, but we, you know, we basically went and you know got almost as high as the South Col on that on that climb. But again, for 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 my interest in, in taking photos, that trip. Uh, yielded some of the best images I've ever taken on an expedition. Right. By this time, you're starting to make a, a, a fairly successful career as a adventure yeah. photographer. Yeah, right around 81. That was my, when I started getting, actually working for Equinox on a regular basis. After Everest, you had four more summits yep. to climb? Yep. What, what came next? Uh, it was uh, Elbrus in uh, the Caucasus Mountains, and that was easy logistically because you could just simply plug into the uh, Russian Mountaineering Association's summer camps in the Caucasus. They ran camps in the uh, Altai and in the Pamirs as well. And um, so the, the peak is a big volcano, a big walk up. So basically I just slotted in there. And that's where Baiba entered the scene as my adventure partner and my business partner and my, you know, she, she came over on that, that trip with me and, and another friend, Jeremy Schmidt. Right. And uh, we, we did the climb and then she went back home to Canada and Jeremy's wife, Wendy, joined us and we went to uh, Africa and did Kilimanjaro, which was a really pleasant walk. Mm -hmm. And um, then... Another couple months after that, uh, Bob and I tried to get to uh, Karsten's Pyramid in Irian Jaya. And uh, 
got within 125 kilometers of the mountain and were turned back by the military because we didn't have the right permits. We had we had one permit, but not from the right departments in the Indonesian government. The peak, uh, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of these mountains are located in border regions, and typically, especially third world countries, are really paranoid about their border regions. You know, especially between India and China, um, Pakistan, and India, and whatever, you know, all those, all these countries are really, um, you know, worried about foreigners wandering around in these, in these border zones for whatever reasons, you know, sometimes they have good reasons for it because of subversive activities, but we're, in our case, just as innocent mountain climbers, it was really frustrating, especially with Karstens Pyramid, because it's a beautiful climb, and the reason we couldn't get any closer was because there was um, some um, rebel activity against the government. The Stone Age people who live in Union Jaya were uh, resisting the uh, bullying techniques of the Indonesian military that were in there. It's basically a police state, just like East Timor is. So, um, I mean, we were completely oblivious to all that when we went there. We just went there as climbers, wanting to climb this peak. And, and we ended up, instead of being able to get to the peak, we, we spent a month in the highlands, you know, with the Stone Age people, living with them in their villages. And for me, it was just as rewarding as climbing any, any mountain. Yeah. The first time we, we went down to Antarctica, I, I joined forces with my friend Martin Williams from Whitehorse. And he's a wilderness guide that's been was based in Yukon for 10 or 15 years, and he he had lots of experience guiding on the St. Elias Ice Cap, and really quite remote and very inhospitable places, so he was the ideal partner to be involved with in Antarctica. And um, we found a Californian uh, a developer who, ha who could afford to charter an airplane to go to Antarctica. And that was our key, you know, it was just sort of a series of um, connections, you know, within, between, in, in the community of adventurers and people who want to be adventurers. And uh, this fellow turned out to be a really neat guy, Steve Drogan, and has uh, remained a friend to this day. But Steve got, um, Steve's goal was to get to the South Pole. And Mount Vincent, Antarctica's, Antarctica's highest peak, happens to be between, you know, on the way to the pole. So we volunteered to go along as guides to help him out, uh, to help him survive, basically, in that cold place. As long as we could stop off long enough to, to make a base camp at the mountain and uh, climb it. When we finally did get down to our peak, the next year, oh, no, okay, the first year we went down, we landed on the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula at an Argentine base because the Argentines had offered to sell us fuel once we're down there. And it's all very complicated because Antarctica is uh, the only continent that doesn't have sovereignty. You know, no one owns the continent. There's only signatory countries that have signed the Antarctic Treaty uh, that are in position down there. But nonetheless, they still treat it like they own it, you know, especially the Americans, uh, who are really tight. You know, it's an old boys club that wants to resist anyone else coming in there, especially adventurers, especially private companies that are bringing tourists down there. So we, we had to go through one of the other signatory countries. There's Argentina and Chile that's on the north side of uh, the continent, you know, towards South America, in the direction that our mountain lies. And uh, so anyway, we headed out um, onto, across the Drake Channel, you know, 600 miles of open ocean, landed, went into the, the base that night, and got hit by a windstorm, which uh, almost blew our plane into the ocean. And uh, in the process, it damaged the, one of the engines, 
and uh, we didn't realize this until a couple weeks later. But meanwhile, we were stranded in Antarctica for a week. At, well, the plane went back to Argentina to be repaired to the, the damage to the fuselage. And uh, finally, when the plane picked us up, it took us north and we landed in Chile instead of Argentina. Because we had complications. Our, uh, our pilot and co-pilot were Brits, and uh, the Falklands had just happened you know, the year before. And they were, when they flew up to, uh, to have the repairs done to the plane, they were put under a hotel arrest for a couple of days while the plane was repaired. It was all very uh, embarrassing and really quite awkward for a while there. But nonetheless, so we went back, and this time we went to Chile, and we're, we're going to plan to fly from Chile back down to Antarctica and get help, get an airdrop of fuel from the Chileans. And um, when we landed in Antarctica again on Adelaide Island, that's when the engineer discovered damage to one of the engines. And, you know, we were just a, a six-hour flight from the mountain at that point. <clears throat> So you got up Mount Vincent there on, mm -hmm. on your your second try. Yes. But you were still short uh, Karsten's pyramid. Yes, and then Karsten's came. Uh, I was at, Bob and I were actually down in Ontario writing this Seven Summits book, you know, Beyond Everest Quest for the Seven Summits, and uh, we finally got permission to go back to Karsten's. We got three levels of government to give us permission to go, and that involved a trip to New York City. To get a uh, to meet with the president of a big mining company that's located near the mountain, and this allowed us to go through the mine site in order to access the peak, and uh, plus going through different levels of bureaucracy in Indonesia. <clears throat> but one of the positive things about the first our first attempt to get to the mountain was that we met these Indonesian climbers who were on their way to climb Karstens. And uh, we kept in touch with them. And um, eventually, we were able to host them here in Canada for three weeks uh, as, you know, to show them snow climbing techniques. You know, and took them into the Bugaboos, took them into climb uh, Athabasca. And here are guys who live on the equator who have never touched snow in their lives. And, um, and they, they actually, learned enough to go on to other expeditions in Peru and in northern India, you know, to do their own climbs. And, um, and eventually it was through one of those guys that we actually were able to uh, uh, get that, those special permits in, in Indonesia. Right, and how was that climb when you eventually... Uh, it was uh, lovely. It was... Uh, uh, limestone, but unlike the limestone here, it was it's really warm because it rains like hell every day, every day there. Like uh, it's on the equator, and it's um, in the morning it's generally clear, and then the, the the cumulus builds up, and then it just pisses on top of the rock, and it cleans it all off. So it was really prickly limestone. You just had to slap your hand on it, and uh, your hand your skin would stick to it. But it, it was. It's relatively serious in that it's um, it's around 5,000 meters, and um, the Indonesians in particular ha have a hard time climbing there because they're 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 not used to the cold, wet cold, like they're used to being hot down low, and when it's raining on you, it's just pouring down, you know, li literally uh, like being in Vancouver in the in the rainy season, it just pelts down, so you. If you if someone got injured or something up there, they could get hypothermic. And there there has there was one Indonesian that actually died from exposure because of that. Um, How did you feel uh, completing your quest? Uh, well, there you go. There's there's the the big hole again. You know, um, by this time though, like all the the experience that I'd picked up in terms of you know, establishing a goal and then going through all the, the procedure that is necessary to get there, 
I, I developed other ideas along the way for climbing or for just adventuring, you know, like big treks and Himalayas and stuff. And um, so f then there, there's a basic couple, uh, basic formula that I, I've been following ever since the, the finish of the Seven Summits. I'll still um, go out on climbs for my own personal enjoyment locally, whether it's, uh, you know, one half pitch sport climbs or longer traditional routes on Eeyore or whatever. But um, my main interest these days is, is more toward travels through the mountains than actual expeditions to particular mountains. Uh, because I get, I get more enjoyment out of traveling a bit every day, seeing new scenery, and meeting the indigenous peoples that live in those mountains usually. And, and it turns out that my favorite Places, place has become the Himalayas. It's a, just a huge, vast mountain range with hundreds and hundreds of different types of people living in those mountains, and they're almost always wonderful people to be amongst. How do you feel about your, your place there in, mm -hmm. in Canadian mountaineering? The, the things that I accomplished weren't uh, mountaineering accomplishments. They were more logistical accomplishments, you know, like overcoming the difficulties of getting to the mountains, which not many climbers can do because they don't have the patience or the determination. You know, if it's too hard, they'll go to another mountain or, or, or you know, but I had to get to those some of those mountains because it was part of the project. And so um, that's where I, I see whatever I've contributed has been a possibility for other climbers now who want to go to a couple of those mountains. You know, in particular, as I mentioned before, that one in Antarctica and one in, in, in Jaya. But uh, in terms of contribution, overall contribution, I think the if, if any of my photos can stimulate uh, people to go out and climb and any of the, the articles in the magazines and stuff, more so than the actual peaks themselves.